God, this is our prayer that all glory and honor be unto you. Not only from our lips, but also from our lives. And so today, God, as we get to sit and to hear your word, it's our prayer that God, by your Holy Spirit, you will instill this word into our hearts. You'll cause, Father, the instructions for, from it become our conviction, become our philosophy, become our rule of life. So God, we pray, may you illuminate your word to give us clarity. Help us, O oh God, to have the faith like the faith of a centurion. Let's speak one word and my servant shall live. Today we pray that you may speak to us through your word, for that is the food for our soul and for our journey. God, I thank you as your servant. I pray that I may find favor before you, even as I get to break the word. And it's my prayer that God, by your Holy Spirit, you'll take preeminence and take charge over this session this morning. In Jesus' name we, we pray. Before you sit, I just want us to read. I will allow the praise and worship to go. And then I will request that we all get continue standing in honor of the reading of God's word. And then uh, we shall be seated. Today, our reading comes from the book of Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. And I'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 5. But uh, I'll not be reading the entirety of verse 5. I'll only be reading the first part of verse 5. I'm reading from the ESV version. Micah chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 5. The Bible says, Now master your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, my father, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose origins is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. And that ends the reading of God's inerrant word. Praise be to him. May you be seated. Just before we get to look at God's word, allow me to just make one announcement. This is the last Sunday of the year 2021. Next Sunday, we hit the road on a new year. God willing. And we praise God for that. Uh, since the time of COVID, it has been a, a very challenging. But God, by his grace, has given us wisdom. We have adjusted ourselves to the times. But... Uh, I want to request that next Sunday, the parents, you get to come with your children, just like the way we used to do in other times, before COVID, let's be having the children coming into the sanctuary. Let them get to have the experience of worshiping God with us, and also seeing us worship the Lord. It is said that children learn more from seeing than from hearing. And when they see you lift up your hands, it's a good lesson. So as they come, then at some point we shall be releasing them to the Sunday school. Is that okay? Yeah, we had removed them because there was uh, uh, the need for social distance. But uh, let's start from next Sunday to be doing that and then we can release them. 
Is that clear? Sour, sour. Let's get to the word of the Lord this morning. Today we get to look at the topic of Jesus as the ruler. Or Jesus the ruler. And I want to thank God for providence that today I get to look at this text because as I was just seated here, I thought about this season of Christmas. We focus so much on the story of the nativity, which is okay. That is concerned the birth. And uh, we might concentrate so much on Jesus as a baby and forget that that was not the end of why he came. His coming was unique. As you are going to see, in it, it has several things that we need to learn from. But ultimately, Jesus is the ruler from of old. And he, even as he came, he came and he began to build for himself a kingdom by calling 12 disciples representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And in that way, symbolically, declaring that he has begun a new Israel where now it's not only comprised of the Jews but even of Gentiles to as many as will call him even to the ends of the earth. And so ultimately that group of people become the people of God and Jesus as their ruler. Praise the Lord. And so today we get to look at Jesus as the ruler. To help us to be able to bring this topic home is the prophet Micah. We have just read from the prophet Micah, or you may call him Micah, in the Old Testament. He's one of the, what we call the minor prophets. But that terminology is really very misleading because it assumes that there are people who have a greater message and others have a lesser message. That is just a theological terminology of saying that some people have bigger books and others have smaller books. So the major prophets have work that spans for many years and it was voluminous. For example, someone like Isaiah is one of the major prophets. He has 66 chapters. And then we have Jeremiah, we have Daniel. And those form part of the major prophets and Ezekiel. But then we have these others who also have not so much in terms of size, but their content is potent. It's, it's deep. And so Micah is one of them. For us to be able to look at the text that is before us, I just want to do uh, one thing, and then we get into the text. And what is it that I want us to do? Let me give you the outline. We need to look at the context of the book. The context. Every prophecy was written to a people within a geographical location, undergoing various circumstances and it is important that we understand that so that we can get to sit where they sit and hear what they had and be able to see what they needed to see because it is by hearing God correctly that you can be able to obey him correctly and thereby worship and honor him. So we need to see the text in its context. And that is also very, very important because this Prophecy is written more than 2,700 years ago. And so that can seem like their situation is too far away from where we are. And we can be tempted to simply look at it like history. But there is something that we need to be very clear of. The word of God never gets stale. The word of God is alive as it was yesterday, as it was 2,007 years ago. As it is spoke to that generation, it is also speaking to us. The same challenge that was given to the same people or rather to people 2,007 years ago comes home to us today. Because you know what? As Ecclesiastes says, uh, there is nothing new under the sun. Many things don't change that much. Those of you who are older can be able to relate some of the fashion that you used to wear with what is happening today and it's trendy. Nothing new. So we need to see and to understand that this message is so relevant to us and it's our message today. So we need to look at the context. 
And within that context, then we get to see the message. The message has two parts. There is impending judgment. And then there is a hope that is promised. So context, judgment, and hope. Is that simple to grasp? I think it is, isn't it? Context. That becomes even harder. So let me just drive into it to be able to explain what I mean by context. Because as we are trying to say what was happening in this time that Micah is prophesying. Micah is prophesying. Micah, or rather, Micah is raised as a prophet by God to be able to be a, a channel of his message. The prophets were not only telling the people what will become, but the prophets were also preachers who were used by God to call people back into the covenant that God established with their fathers. And we all know that the people are, by, by, by me saying the people here, I mean the people of Israel. Because these were the people of covenant. And so the prophets are preachers. And they are given a message. But as they are coming, the good thing about the Bible is that they are not coming in an empty space. They are coming to a people who are going through life just like the way we are going through and we are going to see. And so they speak this message. What was going on when Micah was preaching the message that we have before us? If you have a pen, and probably if you can be able to flip through your Bible, we shall be going through a few verses in the book just to be able to have a feel of what is going on in the book of Micah. If you look at Micah chapter 1 verse 7, we see Micah uh, rebuking the people in Samaria. And he says this about what is going on in their lives. God is going to bring about judgment on what? All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. And all her pay, all and all her pay as a harlot shall be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. Here, the word harlot which is a prostitute, is being used as a figurative language. Israel was like the bride of God. It was betrothed to God. It's a picture. It's a metaphor, a picture of the relationship that God has with his people. And so what had happened was that in these times, the people had given themselves over to idol worship. And now beginning to worship another God when you have God, Jehovah Yahweh, as your God, that is called playing the prostitution. That is why Halotli is here. If you remember, uh, maybe I forgot to say this, but Micah prophesied at the same time with the two other prophets. The same time, in the land of Judah, in the southern kingdom, we had prophet Isaiah also prophesy. So a lot of what Isaiah says is also capturing the same context of what Micah is saying. And then to the north, there was another prophet called prophet Hosea. What do we know about Hosea? Hosea was told to go and marry a prostitute. You remember that lady called Goma? You remember some of you who have read the Bible? Yes, yes, let's be in conversation. And if you remember, that was a picture that God wanted to portray before the Israelites what they are doing to him. Hosea would go and get that wife, pay maximum dowry, prize for her. And the next moment, she is going to look for other men. He goes to look for her. They get a child. You would think that with a child, she will settle. Then she goes again. And then he would go and get her. And for three times, the Bible in the book of Hosea is showing 
how Israel is being loved by God just like Hosea loves Gomer. But it's playing the harlot. Idolatry had come in the land in a very great way. It was grievous. And God was grieved and he sent this message. God is a loving God. He continues to call his people back to repentance. Before judgment comes, God will always give the people an opportunity to turn. So there was idolatry in the land. The second thing that you get to see is that there was land grabbing. There was corruption. People's family land would be taken by those who are stronger. Some of you remember the story of Naboth, of Jezreel, and King Ahab. I believe it is in 1 Kings chapter 21. God had instituted a law that there was to be a land, and that land would not shift from family A to family B. It would just circulate within that family. Even if you ever got to, uh, to reach your end and you are giving up your land, there was a way in which you are only to sell it to your, to your relatives. And even if you reach to a place whereby you have sold everything and then you are sold into captivity, after 50 years there was the year of jubilee, you are supposed to be released back so that you can go back to your land. God had given the land to the children of Israel, which was in fulfillment to a promise that he had made to Abraham that I will bless you with a nation and I will bless you also with the land. As far as your eyes can see, this shall be the land allotted to your children. And in Joshua chapter 15, we have Joshua coming after having conquered the lands, the peoples in the land, he begins to allot to the different tribes. And so we get to see that it was important that people maintain their land and continue to do it. In the book of, I believe it is in uh, either Numbers 27, or Levit should be Leviticus 27. You have the daughters of Zelophehad who went to Moses and told Moses, in our family we did not have a man. Shall the name of our father be lost from the earth? Can't we also inherit the land? Moses had gone and God had closed the chapter, but Moses goes to God and God tells him, listen to those daughters. Yes, daughters can inherit so that the name of their father can be maintained. So those were big issues before God. But here we see harassment and land grabbing. Look at Micah chapter 2 verse 2 and 9. They covet fields. They take them by violence. Also houses. They seize them. So they oppress a man and his house. A man and his inheritance. Verse 9. The women of my people you cast out from their pleasant houses. We have seen these things happening. There is a woman I was being told who had some land. And maybe it's a long story. Maybe I can give this other one. I had a friend of mine. Their father had a land in Westlands. One acre. Many of the leadership, they even had the title deed. But that lady was telling me thrice they went there and they found someone has already fenced. They removed the fence. They tried to put their own after some time, after some time, another person. And sooner than later, their old father told them that land is going to go. There was also a story in the nation newspapers, I think about three, four years ago, where someone has bought, had bought a plot in town, in Grogon. Their fathers were the ones who bought those houses. Alafu unaenda unakuta ya kwamba, auctioneers wanatoa kila mtu huko. Unaanza kuuliza na nimelipa landred, unaambiwa nyumba siya yako. Ukienda kwa kanji, unakuta kila kitu kimebadlishwa. These things are happening. And it is the same thing that was happening. The women were being thrown out and their land was being grabbed. Do you see? It's the, same thing, it's the same thing that is happening even in our times. Maybe I need to move a little bit quickly. When we come to the leadership, 
There was a general failure in the leadership of the nation. If you look at Micah chapter 3 and also chapter 7, maybe you can begin from Micah chapter 3. Uh, let me just look at Micah chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3. What does the Bible say? Hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil? You who tear the skin from the people and their flesh from off their bones? You who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Man eat man society. That's what, when the late president of Tanzania came to Kenya, he saw it was a beautiful country. We also had the ideology of capitalism. Their nation was still poor, but it was under the ideology of socialism. But one thing he noted is that Hapa, he called it man eat man society and that has been happening where many people want leadership not for what they will give but for what they will take how I pray that in the coming year 2022 God shall give us leaders who are selfless and will be able to take those responsibilities for what they can deliver for the good of the people to the glory of God I believe we still have such a remnant in our generation, but there are few. The other final thing, of course, it's not the only one, but I would like you to read the book and you're going to see some of these things, is that there was failure in religious leadership. Just look at uh, verse 10 of chapter 3. Maybe you can begin from verse 9. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight. So there was injustice in the land. Verse 10. Who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests. Now listen to this. Now niambia kama ujaona ikwa TV and all around us whenever you visit places for lunch hour services. Its priests. Listen. Teach for a price. It's prophets practice divination for money. There are so many places today where you go before you see the man of God, you must pay a fee to be able to see them. I can actually name them. There's a place where you have to pay 2,000 shillings for you to be able to see the man of God. If you want prayer, you have to have, I think, a thousand shillings. If you, want to, if you want prayer with the anointing, even for your feet to be anointed, you have to have 5,000 shillings. It is happening right before our eyes, under our noses. It is happening. And this is exactly what was happening. It's prophets practice divination for money, yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? And you have seen these prophecies on TV. The Lord told me that in your home, kuna mwenye anawaroga. But if only you can give a certain fee, there's going to be deliverance. And we will send that curse back to the enemy and you start seeing people dying and everybody claps. I wonder, what kind of Christians are we? Doesn't Jesus say, pray for your enemies? What kind of gospel is this? We have been called to a ministry of reconciliation and I think the power of Jesus is seen more even when witches turn to Christ. In the times of the apostles, we had somebody like Simon the sorcerer, even him coming and declaring that Jesus is Lord. Even though his heart had not been changed, he was simply seeing an opportunity to make another coin. Because if Christ has not saved you, it doesn't matter how you pretend, at the end of the day, it will still come out. But what I'm saying is that there was corruption in the times of Micah. There is corruption in our times. And it is in this context that Micah comes to declare the prophecy that he is speaking. So in Micah chapter 5, we have now Micah beginning to declare judgment. That is the context. We get to the second point of declaring judgment. And what does Micah say in verse 1? Now, 
Master your troops, O oh, daughter of troops. Sometimes I told you when you, listen, when you look at your Bible, you are going to see that what is written in many prophecies is indented. Sentence zimengia nani? It is poetic language. Sometimes poetic language is coded. So what does it mean when he talks about daughter of troops? If you go to verse 10, you get to see, wreath and groan, O daughter of Zion. The same daughter of troops is daughter of Zion. And this is simply a terminology that is describing the people of Israel. Zion was the word that was used to describe Jerusalem and its people. So Micah is telling them, master your troops, O daughter of troops, because siege is laid against us. He is prophesying that there is a coming a time when there will be, the nation will be surrounded. And Micah is prophesying over 700 years before Christ. He is prophesying in about 700 and some, something BC. And this prophecy is going to be fulfilled about 150 years later. Turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 25 and I get to read a few verses there for you to be able to see. So Micah is telling them, master your troops because siege is laid against us. Let us look at that siege. In 2 Kings chapter 25 verse 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, by the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food uh, for the people on the land. And you can go all the way to verse 9. You don't have time. But Micah is telling them judgment is coming. And judgment is coming in this way. There are enemies who are so strong and so mighty. They are called the Babylonians. So you have read that in verse 10 of chapter 4, Micah chapter 4 verse 10 read and groan, O daughter of Zion like a woman in labor for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country you shall go to Babylon so he's actually prophesying judgment is coming and that judgment there will be a siege and then you shall be taken into captivity, into exile and there it is where you shall be rescued by the Lord so there is a message of hope but before we get there I just want you to see that judgment comes upon sin. The pattern of God has never stopped. God judges sin. And I think there is no better picture than for us to see how God judges sin than when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because in the cross of Jesus Christ is both a picture of God's judgment and God's mercy. We deserve judgment but it was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. All sin of humanity was laid upon him. As he cried, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Judgment was being met on him. And that was so that we may have the opportunity to be removed from judgment into eternal life, a relationship with the Father. We are now, we are no longer condemned, but we have become the righteousness of God because Christ paid the price. There was judgment on the cross, but also together with judgment, there was mercy. God was doing that on Christ so that he can have mercy on humanity because there was no way we would ever come back to God except through Jesus Christ. No wonder Jesus says there is no other way by which men may be saved. I think that was Peter in Acts chapter 4. But Jesus talks about no one comes to the Father except through me. He has become the propitiation. The one who joins lost humanity to God. But what we are seeing is that judgment came upon Christ. Judgment came upon the Israelites through the Babylonians. So we get to see all these aspects of judgment. Micah is saying, master your troops. In verse 3 he says, therefore he shall give them up. God is the one who is giving up his children. Now in judgment is also the message of love. 
God said in the book of Hebrews that a father chastises the child he loves. If God does not chastise us, then we are bastards. A bastard ni mtoto haram. But as long as God is your father, he will chastise you. That you may come back to the point whereby there is guilt, there is a grief, and that grief leads to godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And you can be restored in your fellowship with the father. So here God is saying that he is going to give them up. That is what the prophet has been sent with a message. God is going to give you up. So it is a context of sin. It's a context that is so dark. I told you that Micah prophesied in the same time with Isaiah. What does Isaiah say in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2? That it shall not more, no more be darkness in the land of Naphtali and the land of Zebulun where there was darkness and there was deep gloom. And Isaiah is prophesying at the same time with Micah there was that darkness. So the context is evil, is sinful. People have neglected worship and they no longer care about the things of God. And so judgment is coming. But after judgment, praise God, there is hope. So verse 3, he shall give them up until the time when she who was in labor has given birth. Before we get to the message of hope, I think it is important for me to explain what does that terminology mean. You see labor, uh, some of us can understand it theo theoretically, others know it practically. I'm a civil in Adada. This is only theory, and you need practical. But the whole beauty about labor is that labor is one of the most excruciating pain known to man. But the beauty of it is that out of it produces one of the greatest joys known to man. When that lady holds her baby, all that pain is forgotten. There is a smile on a woman even though there is so much sweat on her nose because of the bundle of joy in her hands. Now here, Micah is using that metaphor and he's saying that God is giving them up they are going to go into captivity. They are going to go into exile. But after exile, God will bring them back. God will bring them back. So there's going to be a time of waiting. There's going to be a time of expecting. There's going to be a time of hope. But if they come back to the same situation like they have always been, Man today may be good, but tomorrow they still fall back into their weaknesses. So that will not assure them of a time when now they can be free from their enemy. And so God himself is also giving them a message of hope when he says in verse 2, there is actually a different time that is coming when he himself will be the ruler. Let us look at verse 2 and we can be able to unpackage it. Uh, the Bible says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, am I Ephrata, who are little among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origins is from of old, from the ancient of days. In the midst of an impending judgment. And they have been, God has been so gracious and so patient with them, but now they have to be taken into exile. But after that exile, in the distant future, is a ruler that is prophesied, and that ruler will be the ultimate ruler. It will be a time where now God comes and dwells among his people, and he establishes a peace that is eternal. From this verse, I know we have been reading it over and over and over. When the prophet was prophesying, it was not so clear to the people. But when you look at it, you get to see a few things. Number one, there is the doctrine of incarnation. The Bible says that he is from Bethlehem. He will come from Bethlehem, Ephrathah. 
Now Bethlehem was in the north. Ephrathah was a, was a, was, was, was a, Bethlehem was a city in Ephrathah. Where is Ephrathah? It is the land of the Ephraimites. And that is where David came from. Although David was from the tribe of Judah, that is where they used to live. And in this place, Bethlehem was among the tiniest of the towns of Judah. And do you know why? Because God's method has always been like this. God uses some of the minutest things to do some of the most major things that glory may be to him. That our faith may be unto God and not to, unto the methodologies of man. If you remember in the time of Gideon, there was a time when Gideon was going to fight the enemies and he had 32,000 soldiers and God said there are too many. Even if I give them victory, everybody will say it was by might, it was by power. I once went and met a man who was very rich and he was saying, he maliote ni metengeneza because of my diligence. It was such a rebuke on his face when I told him, there are so many diligent people but they are not rich. It takes the favor of God. Kuna watu marigiti wali yamuka saatisa and by evening they will not have enough to feed their children even with chapati. Very diligent. God will use the weak for the message to come through. So Gideon is told 32,000 is too much. They were facing an army almost over 100,000. And the number is reduced, it is reduced, it is reduced until 300. How does 300 get to overcome 100,000? There must be God there. So God takes the list of the cities of Judah, Bethlehem, and he says, out of it shall come the ruler of Israel. But something interesting about this ruler, he also has some qualities. He is from Let's just read there. He who is to come is to be ruler in Israel. His origin is from of old. What here Micah is saying is that God has always had the plan of redemption and salvation from as early as the beginning of time. I have been reading time and again here. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is the prophecy of Christ. So he is from of old but another terminology that is used there is that he is from ancient of days. Now that phrase simply means that he is everlasting. It's a quality of God. And interestingly, God who is from everlasting will come from Bethlehem, Ephrathah. In Jesus Christ, there is eternity meeting with the time. God taking on the form of man and dwelling among us. What a joy it is to know that God, who was so far that the Israelites said to Moses, please don't let him speak to us, we shall die, has contextualized himself that he relates with us as a man relates with another man, for he walked among us. Although John says, though he walked among them, they did not even recognize him. John chapter 1, Verse 8, but then the Bible says that to all those who received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. And Paul says, we have been adopted. We can call God Abba Father because of Christ. Praise the Lord. Not only that, there is something that I want us to see very powerful. This prophecy is being given how many years before Christ is born? Over 700, isn't it? By the time Jesus Christ was about to be born, do you know where Mary and Joseph were living? They were living in a town called Nazareth. That was about 90 miles away from Bethlehem. And Mary continues to be pregnant through her first trimester, the second one, even to the third trimester. She's still in Nazareth. 90 miles. There are no SGRs. There are no helicopters. There are no comfortable cars. 
The only transport we have is a camel and a donkey. But God's prophecy is that it will be in Bethlehem. When you read the book of Luke, the Bible says in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, a decree went out that there must be a census in the whole world. A man is commanding the whole world. You may think that he is on top of things, but let me tell you something. There is another one who is mightier and who is stronger and who is greater and is named the everlasting one, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the one who dictates events. He is sovereign. He is the one that moves the heart of the king to cause everybody to be counted and especially they must be counted where they were born or rather where their family was. Like me, I've been a lawyer living in the diaspora. Today I would be finding my way to Vihiga County, Maragoli, Lusala Tambi village, there to be counted. And the decree is being given in a very short notice. So Mary is pregnant. She cannot see her feet. She's too heavy. 90 miles away. But the Bible says that she arrives in Bethlehem on that eve of Christmas, telling me something. What God calls you to do, he gives you grace. It may be too impossible for you. You may wonder how I can be able to make it. But if it is God who has called me, one of the assurances is that he knows how to do it. He makes everything beautiful in its time. Praise the name of the Lord. Secondly, it's also important for us to be able to see that there is no way someone separated from the event for 700 years would have come to pass in every minute detail of the prophecy. It was from Bethlehem, a father, out of you shall rise one who is from of old. Micah is prophesying about Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew chapter 2, we have the wise men coming and they say to Herod, we saw the star in the east. We, they were the wise men of the stars. They would be able to see this star is indicating the birth of a king, the birth of a ruler. We saw it and we began following it. But to Mephika, Hapa, Imepotea, where is this king born? Then Herod is shocked, but he calls his wise men, who are of course Jews, and he tells them, Imambo Munaijua, where will they, there is a king to be born, where will he be born? And they say, the prophet I think it's good that we just read there, Matthew chapter 2 and uh, verse 5 to 6. You can read all the way, maybe from chapter 9, rather from verse 1 to uh, to verse 9. But I'm just going to read verse 5 and 6 of Matthew chapter 2. What does the Bible say? Please allow me. Sometimes when, what you want, when you want something is when it hides. But thank God it is already here. Verse 5, the Bible says, They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. This prophet that we are reading about is prophet Micah. What does he say? And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So they are able to articulate the prophecy. It had been spoken. And what God says must come to pass. Because what he says, he means. And he means what he says. I can, what this verse is telling me is that I can trust God with his promises no matter the circumstances. God had prophesied before they went into captivity. They went into captivity. They were oppressed. They were almost decimated. They sang Psalm 137. How shall we sing the songs of Zion in the land of captivity? They were not even able to breathe because of the oppression. If you read the book of Esther, there was a man there by the name of 
Haman who wanted to decimate all the Jews so that the promises of God cannot come to pass. Of course, it was the enemy working through Haman so that nothing about the word of God can come to pass. But who is like my God? That he raises a young, simple village girl who was just a simple virgin. She is married to a king and she can whisper to the king, my people are perishing. She calls upon the name of the Lord in fasting and in the book of Esther. The king asks, who is that? And the man who had planned for Israel to be decimated, who was the one that was decimated? And from that day, they have the holiday of Adar. The 13th day was a sad day for the Jews, but God turned around the captivity and they became like men who dream dreams. Praise the Lord. The same God has not ceased to be who he is. Many times you can look at your circumstances until you wonder, is this Christianity worth the sacrifice that I give into it? Some of you have lost your job. Some of you have lost friends. Some of your families are broken simply because you are being told to compromise and you cannot. And because of that, you have been thrown out. You have been rejected. But let me tell you something. God knows how to make it beautiful. The Israelites are in a place whereby they think all is lost. And suddenly, here is Christmas. He who is from old has come from Bethlehem, and he shall be ruler. Let's just quickly wind up as we look at verse 4. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great even to the ends of the earth. God, Jesus as he comes, he is the ruler. And he begins to gather his people. I've just told you how he began in the first time of his coming, the 12 disciples. Then he tells them to go into the entire land of Israel because he has been sent but to the lost sheep of Israel. And he is calling the people back to him. Those who put their faith in Christ have become a new Israelite. Those who reject him, they become like the Gentiles. No wonder the disciples were told in the house where they reject the message that you have, Come out and hit your feet on the ground because that was Israel's methodology. Whenever you are coming from Gentile territory into Israel, you are supposed to hit so that the dust of Gentiles does not enter into the land of the people of God. And in essence, Jesus was saying that now there is a new Israel whereby those who have been redeemed have become the new community of God's people. And praise God that we are also within that generation where we have also been given the great commission to call as many as will turn to the Lord and believe him for salvation. The Apostle Peter in the first address in the day of Pentecost said that this promise was meant to you and to your sons and even to as many as the Lord God shall call. And how does God call? Paul says in the book of Romans, how shall they believe unless they hear? How shall they hear unless there is a preacher? As you hear the gospel being preached today, God is gathering his people. Praise the name of the Lord. And what a joy to know that we have been called to be co-workers together with Christ. That God is doing a work. And then let me finish finally by what verse 5a says. And he shall be their peace. Jesus not only gives peace, not only causes you who has been in depression to experience peace, he is himself peace personified. He is a prince of peace. He is the one that can be able to cause you to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. This has been difficult times. Some of us have never experienced peace or known peace. Yesterday I was sharing with some people that it's the first Christmas that I'm having without my father around. I didn't know that it was such a privilege and suddenly in this year I mourned my father. But in Christ there is a peace that surpasses understanding. Praise the name of the Lord. That when I know that he was born again and I will get to see him. Yet, that is not the joy of my heart. The joy of my heart is that I have Christ. I remember listening to Ravi Zacharias and he was saying that after he had preached, somebody came to him 
And you know, sometimes preachers preach until people love them. And he told him, I want to sit to be where you will live in heaven. In Kama utakuwa hapa, you know, some people here, they are mansions. So in your mansion is where I want to live. And Ravi Zacharias told him, when you get to see Christ, you'll have no need of anybody else. He is the delight and the joy of our hearts. He is the Prince of Peace. Didn't Isaiah say, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. It shall be from everlasting to everlasting. He shall be called the Prince of Peace. No wonder here we have that prophecy. So when we remember about Christmas, let me tell you the message is deep. This message did not begin 2,000 years ago, but it is the plan of God. And that is why we have been looking at the coming of Christ from the Old Testament. How I pray that you can be able to see it and live a life that is a worshiping life for you know whom you have believed. And you can be persuaded that he is able to keep that which you have entrusted to him even to that day. May, be, may this be the conviction of your heart. If you are not born again today, Jesus can become your peace. And let me tell you something. He is a ruler. You may not have said Jesus is Lord, but the Bible is saying a time is coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Usingoje wakati ule wenye utakuwa ukisema na unaenda motoni. Sema sahizi na unaenda minguni to be with him forever. If you are not born again, Jesus is still in the business of saving. Amen. Let us bow down. We have just said that Jesus is ruler. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. I praise his name. He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is Lord, I praise his name. He has risen from the dead, he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, he is Lord. You buona, you buona, ah, you buona, as if As we continue singing, kama uko hapo, na unataka kumuambia Yesu ni okoe, just come to the front and we can pray together with you. I don't know whether you are there, but we just want to open this opportunity that you can come and on this Christmas, may you declare Jesus to be Lord. May you be embraced in his love and in his presence. For whoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you there? You're not born again? We can pray together. Jesus is merciful. Jesus is loving. And Jesus is still in the business of saving. We're just waiting for you as we worship the Lord. There is another group. You are born again. But life has treated you in such a harsh way that your faith is so weak and you are praying that God may revive you. Some of us may be like the Israelites in this prophecy. We have a relationship with God, but we have walked in such a compromise that our lives do not show the testimony that we profess with our mouths. You can lift up your hand and then put it down as a sign of faith and calling out to God, have mercy upon me. And God will do that. Amen. You can just put down your hand as you lift it up. The Lord is seeing it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for those hands. The dead is long. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's just pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for this message that is telling us that Jesus came, yes, in swaddling clothes like a baby, but he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the ruler, the ancient of days. Today, God, as we get to see this revelation, it's our prayer that we can respond to it. In our midst, there are those who have lifted up their hands. God, you know their situations. Some have gone through life and life has treated them in such a negative way that today they look at their lives and they can feel that their faith has been waning. Some of them have gone through turbulent times. Even though their faith is strong, yet they have a cry of desperation. Won't you meet me at the point of my need? Some, oh God, are Christians who desire to love you, who desire to have a relationship with you, a fellowship rather, with you. But in their own lives, compromise has found its way. They are like what we are describing about the Israelites. Yet God, you sent the prophets because your desire was that the people may turn and may repent. I lift all these groups to you and I'm praying, God, may you meet each one of them at the point of their need. To those that need revival, I pray for revival. To those that need the strengthening of their faith, may you, oh God, help them to overcome every situation of their lives by trusting in the Lord and knowing that God is faithful from everlasting to everlasting. And so we honor you today and we give you praise. Father, I commit your people to you. I pray that even as we go to our various homes, that you may be with us and that God, you'll give us a beautiful time with our families, those that are here, that you'll give us a beautiful time ministering to us your peace and helping us to meditate upon your word. And may you help our lives to be worshiping lives. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.